as you know, my name is Masika Kevin Irwin from Catholic University in Washington, D.C. And I'm privileged beyond words to be with you today because of the connection of a deceased monk of Pannonhalma, of the Gerard Bekesh, who was my doctoral director at the St. Anselmo in Rome. But Bekesh was an extraordinary man, uh, full of life, full of spiritual depth, uh, multilingual, ecumenically attuned, and just a fine, fine Christian gentleman. In fact, I hope to visit his tomb uh, and visit Panahama at the very end of July uh, and to pay homage to a wonderful, wonderful man and to provide a few comments now in this lecture in his honor about the recent document of Pope Francis on the liturgy, which was published on June 29th. So number one, why a document now on liturgical formation? Well, I'm given to believe that Pope Francis himself called to this document as far back as 2018, spoke to the staff of the Congregation of Divine Worship, and his comment was that he judged there was need, needed more liturgical formation to deepen the reform. And his sense was that a lot of people have gotten to the surface, but not really deepened what the understanding of liturgy is as the central part of the church. And as he says in his letter, I simply desire to offer some prompts or cues from reflections that can aid in the contemplation of the beauty and truth of the Christian celebration. The second reason I would argue is that the Pope wanted to quote, says, reach all of you after writing Perdicionis Custodes a year prior to bishops. That was the motto proprio that he wrote in, in order to reiterate what Pope Paul VI had said, what Pope John Paul II had said, what Pope Benedict had said repeatedly that the reforms of the, of the Vatican Council are the normative and required forms of the whole church. Now, it is true that in 2007, Pope Benedict did issue permission for a wider use of what we then call the extraordinary form. But it turns out that in that evolution, in, in those intervening years, since 2007, it was the assessment of the bishops themselves who were consulted by the Pope, by Pope Francis, and the consensus of leadership in the congregation of divine worship, that what happened was rather than facilitate a reconciliation with the Lefebites and the followers of Archbishop Lefebvre and branch there, the, the offer was to celebrate the Trinity Mass, rather than bridge, bridge that gap, it caused more and more division in, in the church. And in fact, we had an assessment that the Trinity Mass was also the Trinity Church with people not following the reforms of the Vatican II. I'll give an example of this. Um, a few years ago, I was in, residing in a parish in Washington, D.C., and uh, I was going out one day for a walk, and a man was coming in for the early morning Trinity Mass on Sunday. And he said to me, are you ever going to say our Mass? And I said, well, I was not allowed by the Archbishop to do so. And he was not pleased. But I was interested in our Mass, was what he said. I also was not pleased when I found out that the catechism class they were offering after that was not the catechism of the Catholic Church containing social justice, <clears throat> doctrine, and morals. It was an older catechism that had nothing to do with social justice. So I, I do experience what the Pope has said, that a lot of people are not following that in two documents, and they want the Trinity Mass for themselves, Whereas you want to reiterate what the Pope said, said and it's normative that the reform of Vatican II is the reform liturgy of the church. Now, two major themes. I would just to pick out two major themes in the document. I would say that one was the Pope was emphasizing the theological meaning of the liturgy. He's not talking about rules, he's not talking about directives. He's not talking about architecture. He's not talking about music. He's talking about a theological understanding of what 
the liturgy is and how to mind that and to deepen our understanding of that. I often say that every text, every gesture, every action, and the raising up of our fellow creatures in liturgy and sacraments have theological meanings, and sometimes more than one. Hence the importance of a phrase from the Vatican II document on liturgy and the reform. Liturgy has texts and rites, and each and all of them contain theological meanings, not just what do we do, but why are we doing this? Number two, the Pope emphasizes the Ars Celebrandi, which is something that Pope Benedict spent a good bit of time emphasizing as well. In other words, the way that we celebrate the liturgy, and he calls that the Ars Celebrandi. He puts it this way in a very, very compelling text. Let me quote the Pope about a list of approaches which, though opposed to each other, characterize a way of presiding that is certainly inadequate. Rigid austerity or expressing creativity, a spiritualizing mysticism or practical functionalism, a rush, briskness or an overemphasized slowness, a sloppy carelessness or an excessive thinkiness, which means attentive to details, and a superabundant friendliness or priestly impassibility. Uh, as a priest presider uh, regularly in the parish, I take that to be an examination of conscience as to how I attempt to lead and try to do the best job I can in terms of presiding at the liturgy. I often say to myself, when I want to fix this attitude about how I preside, I want to imitate John the Baptist to say I'm not the Messiah, it's not about me. And I also want to say the soul went out to sow the seed. And the seed is what matters, not the sower. And a certain amount of self, putting myself in, a, in my proper place is not to put myself forward and to be the star of the show. But what about the term formation as opposed to information? And the word formation has, on its own has several meanings. Information uh, it could be about um, the nature of forming or a process of being formed, like the formation of the Rift Valley in Africa, or a structure, or even of something like a cloud formation, as I'm sitting in my office here with the clouds outside. The military is a question of arrangement of troops to be formed, a battle formation. And sad to say, how often are we watching that on the news these days in terms of Ukraine and Russia? And then also formation of a process of assimilation into a group a charitable organization, a civic organization, a scouting movement, that's a Columbus movement, being formed into a group and get a group identity. It also requires engaged, formation engaged, requires the engagement of the mind as well as engaging heart, emotions, affections, and to live an encounter with God. Not a mental understanding of God, but as the preface for Sundays, one of them says, in you we live and move and have our being. We abide in God by means of this unique liturgy, as opposed to other means of prayer and other means of study. Initial formation in the Catholic Church now is the right of Christian initiation of adults, meaning including liturgies and processes. Same thing is about initial formation, we call that in seminarians, or seminary studies, an ongoing formation of all the baptized, the clergy, and religious, and deacons. In other words, information about any and all of these things assists in the formation, now we're becoming a part of, the reality of God in and through liturgy. But differently, Liturgy requires more than learning facts to inform and to understand. Information about, for example, its history in various parts of the world, the many rites celebrated in the Eastern and Western churches, lead to our continuing information in ever deeply into what the Pilgrim Church is as the community of the baptized that celebrates this unique reality of 
That's the mystery. Where does this come from? This comes from the sources of the literature itself. So scripture, the lectionary, especially the scriptures of the daily, the daily liturgy. These days we're, we're, we're reading Isaiah and we're reading uh, the Gospel of Luke as an example. But the texts and rites describe also how to conduct the liturgy so that both what we say and what we do in the liturgy in terms of actions and movement and gesture are theological sources. One of my concerns over the translation issues in the English language world, which have been for a long time and gratefully have come to an end, um, has been a high concentration on the adequacy and the theology of the translations. Fair enough. Very, very important. But my sense is that has led to a certain educative or didactic notion of liturgy. And that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Liturgy is not just about texts and ideas. It's about how texts can, can shape us and realize the richness of who God is and who Jesus Christ is through the liturgy. That's what it's about. And it's not just to understand. Do you know what's going on? Hopefully, yes, and by the text we do and the rites, but how has that affected us? in terms of attitudes and conversion. Give an example uh, of, of this information, help information. The oldest prayer that we have to proclaim on Christmas Day is the opening collect. And uh, the prayer is from St. Leo the Great, whom the Pope quotes many times, of course, three times in the, in the letter. And this is the text of, of, this is the text of Christmas Day. O oh God, who wonderfully created the dignity of the human race and still more wonderfully restored it, grant, we pray, that we may share in the divinity of Christ who humbles himself to share in our humanity. Now, in this era of sound bites and social messaging and all that, that is the sound bite. That is the summary of what the feast of Christmas is all about. It's about God becoming human so we could become like God. That's the trick. So we're not watching a crash. You know, we're not imagining what it was like uh, in the first century. That's not the point. The point is, how do we experience here and now that divinity of Christ, that, that being grace-filled in the divinity of Christ? This is as rich as it gets. Christ came to put a face on God. Christ came into the world in our very human lives as the word made flesh. And in that unique, and I would dare say history-changing moment, he invites us to share in his divinity again and again the liturgy. Note the emphasis that Pope Francis puts on the fact that God always invites us to celebrate the liturgy. God invites us. In fact, there's a commentary on the importance of bells in the monastery. And monks are taught that when the bells ring, that's the voice of God calling us, yes, one more time back to the liturgy. In addition, the Feast of Christmas, the description of the Missal indicates that the usual bowing of the head during the evaluation of the creed is changed on Christmas so that we kneel at the words, and he was incarnate. We kneel because we're adoring the fact that in our humanity we can now share divinity. And we bow before the one who came to do that, the incarnation of Christ. Gospel of John on that, on that Christ, uh, Christmas day says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. The word became flesh, dwelt, and we have seen his glory. His glory is in us. The meaning of the word incarnate means more than he was born. To be incarnate, to be enfleshed, means that Jesus the Christ, the anointed one of the Father, took human flesh and through the liturgy now, continually invites us and makes us nothing less than bearers of God in our world. 
sometimes in a very expansive liturgy like Christmas, it's hard to kind of whittle it down to the bare facts. Well, that's what it is. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, we saw his glory. God became human, so humans could become God. That's why liturgy is so important. No other prayer, no other gesture can do that, except the liturgy, which is a memorial of who Christ is. Let me talk a little bit about the words knowledge and wisdom. Uh, I was a doctoral student at Santa Anselmo in Rome from 1974 to 1977. Now, that probably shocks a lot of you, and you're probably grinning about the fact that I am among the grumpy old men of my time, but here I am, and yet I have some longevity with me. And it means that I studied it in a pre-internet world. We had no chalkboards. We had chalkboards, and not, but not screens. No search engines, but we did the searching by hand. No computers, no handheld tablets or cell phones, like many of you have in front of you right now. I can remember very, very well the assignment of one of the giants in the constellation of San Anselmo professors, who was Father Cipriano Bagagini. And Father Bagagini uh, asked us, required of us, that we do a search by hand in printed books in Latin of the words knowledge and wisdom in the writings of St. Augustine and how to distinguish them. To distinguish sciencia, knowledge, from sapientia, wisdom. Turns out that in the evolution of Father Bagatini's thought, those became very, very important words. Sapiential, uh, that we would know uh, of God, and it's theology and liturgy, and not just about, we would be immersed in God. And that's why later in life he spoke about a sapiential theology. And that word is used in the Pope's document. He argues for a liturgical, sapiential approach to theology. So theology that the Pope is talking about is very Benedictine. I'll give an example. It's one thing to go into a museum and say, isn't it that interesting that this happened there, and this happened there, and this happened there? Another, another way of looking at it, and that's a museum, you kind of observe. But if you go into a church, you know where you belong. I belong here. This is part of who I am and part of who the church is. The gathered assembly in the church. And it means I'm committed to this. I'm committed to it with all its ups and downs. But it's not a curiosity. It's not an idea that tingles my mind. It's a passion into which I am drawn by the liberty. I judge that Pope Francis is really calling for a wisdom theology, and among the wealthy sources are the texts and rights of the unity. The Pope says the following. Liturgy is, is not about a number 41. Liturgy is not about knowledge and its scope. It's not primarily pedagogical, even though it does have great pedagogical value. Rather, liturgy is about praise, about rendering thanks for the Passover of the Son, whose power reaches our lives. The celebration concerns the reality of our being docile to the action of the Spirit who operates through it until the Christ informed in us. The full extent of our formation, again, formation, is, not con is, is our conformation to Christ. I repeat, it does not have to do with the abstract mental processes, but with becoming Him. This is the purpose for which the Spirit is given, whose action is always and only to confect the body of Christ. It is that way with Eucharistic bread and with every one of the baptized called to become always more and more that which was received as a gift in Christ's baptism, namely being a member of the body of Christ. And again, it quotes Leo the Great. Our participation in the body and blood of Christ has no other end than to make us become that which we eat. So we all become Christ. Baptism leads to Eucharist. Examples of, of formation for the liturgy. In other words, how can we prepare ourselves to appreciate 
the words and the signs and symbols of the liturgy, uh, what would be some things we should get our heads around before we, as we learn more about it and deepen our experience of it? Well, the first one is um, all liturgy is Paschal. Now, Paschal mystery, uh, that can be a very hard slot for many people. But mystery does not mean something I'll discover the truth of. It means it is, it is God's mysterious being and the mystery of God into which we are drawn because Christ is Paschal mystery. Paschal means obedience, humiliation, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ. Simply put, but it's not so simple. And what God needs to open our minds and hearts to salvation that draws us into the same, same mystery day by day, and especially during the Lenten Easter cycle. Liturgy uh, does not, uh, back for a second here. the notion of time of liturgy that is operative is that liturgy is always a memorial action. Give an example. An example of what the rabbis would say to remember is to give life, to forget is to let die. So the word remember in the Bible is a very, very compelling, active word that invites us into this experience. Interestingly enough, when the liturgy talks about the Paschal mystery, again, humiliation, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, it never does that without talking about our being part of the Paschal mystery. Think about it. Easter Prefer says, dying, you destroyed our death, rising, you restored our life for Jesus' coming glory. Well, death, life, second coming. That's Paschal mystery. But it always refers to the fact that we are celebrating it because Christ in this very moment dead, risen, and to come again is cleansing us, destroying our death, restoring us to life. So the pronouns are not Christ did this, Christ did that, Christ did this. The pronouns are dying, he did this for us. Rising, he did this for us. And we experience that in the liturgy, in the participation in the Paschal mystery. So all liturgy is Paschal. Another thing to be aware of as we talk about getting ready to understand the liturgy is the question of all liturgy is communal. Now, very often the Pope has talked about individualism and, and uh, a culture of consumerism, which reflects certainly a good bit of the American agenda these days. But fundamentally, from the very beginning, uh, they are. Christian tradition is essentially communal. It's about being a part of each other. It, it's it's we are we are not individuals. We are a community, and as a community, we participate in that life. So, what comes first is the community of the church into which I am baptized and into which I am conferred, and from which I draw my strength. So, it's the question is it's to recall that the liturgical pronouns. I would say Catholic pronouns are always plural. We pray, we ask, and as the Pope says in the letter, quote, the liturgy does not say I but we, and any limitation on the breadth of this we is always demonic. The liturgy does not leave us alone to search out individual supposed knowledge on the mission of God. Rather, it takes us by the hand together as an assembly to lead us deep within the mystery that the word and the sacramental sign reveal to us. And it does this consistent with all action of God, following the way of the incarnation, that is, by means of the symbolic language of the body, which extends to things in space and time. Again, Father Bacagini was a further professor, and he had us read a book <clears throat> that he wrote <clears throat> called The Flesh is the instrument of salvation. And that phrase is from Tertullian, and it means that our bodies, our bodiliness is involved in worship. And sometimes I think we don't realize that, but the bodiliness of worship, our 
processing and moving and standing and sitting, uh, all part of the stuff of, of how we engage and are engaged in the liturgy. And in a very particular way, he says in uh, section, uh, in number 60, he speaks about the right relationship of the church and the presiding minister. And then he says, in the Eucharistic prayer in which all of the baptized participate by listening with reverence and in silence, the intervening and intervening the act of the acclamation, the presiding has the, has the strength in the name of the whole people of God to remember before the Father the offering of the Son. And there's an awful lot in that, and there'll be pause there. First of all, continual formation is what the Pope is talking about. So if you were to look at paragraph 78 and 79 in the instruction on the missile, you would find the description of the Eucharistic prayer and all of its parts. And sometimes we keep our, our ears out for this is my body, words of Jesus, uh, extraordinary words, but the whole Eucharistic prayer is worth understanding to see how the spirit is operative, how the church is operative, how we pray together for each other, and it's an act of praise and thanksgiving. So <clears throat> it just seems to me that that's one way that we can continue our formation in liturgy by way of understanding what the Eucharistic prayer is and reading them over uh, again before Mass starts or after Mass or as our, our meditation because the words of the liturgy are so, sometimes so terse that you can almost miss them. Now, if you miss them, don't worry. The ritual will come back and we'll hear it again. But my point is, having a vocabulary, having a, uh, an imagination nurtured by the liturgy is going to give us the kind of formation that the Pope, I think, wants us to do, to give us. That formation from the liturgy he speaks about the celebration of the liturgy, particularly in seminaries. And he notes, in addition to a program of studies, it must offer the possibility of experiencing the celebration that is not only exemplary from a ritual point of view, but also authentic and alive, which allows the living out of a true communion in God, the same communion toward which theological knowledge must tend. So I did serve for a while as the director of liturgy at the Roman College in Rome. Um, I, I don't want to sugarcoat that experience. I, I think I earned my stripes uh, in the seminary and trying to negotiate liturgy. Uh, but the value that the seminary put on liturgy was a value that the Congregation for Catholic Education spoke about in a document in 1979, and now the Pope speaks like that again, the value of a good liturgy at the seminary. So I think some habits can be gleaned from a seminary liturgy that will shape the priests. For example, the quality of music. It's a big, big, big discussion, and I've been up and down, around and through. But at the end of the day, I think that we should be singing more psalms and fewer hymns. And as seminaries negotiate that, that might have some good staying power so that the priests can share the knowledge of the psalms with people who can use. Beauty and art. Um, we all have our criteria for beauty and art, but I'm, I'm going to argue that uh, if the chapel is beautiful, and there's some art in the building that raises our minds and hearts to God, that's a good, good thing, and could be a way of shaping how seminarians can react to the Catholic Church's tradition of beauty and the arts, for goodness sake. It's who they are. The Archella Brandi, the way that deacons proclaim the gospel, the way that acolytes uh, serve mass, the way that priests preside, um, and uh, I can say that there's also a uh, a built-in critique uh, that's a, a community of like, like seminary. But also, I did spend three years in the monastery, and um, most, of the, most of the monks were priests, and about six brothers. And I can assure you, if any priest took an inordinate long time at presiding, he would get a critique before dinner. And there was, they would let us, they, they, the liturgy police, would say too long, Father. So, and that's kind of a refiner's fire about, about that. 
gives the emotion quite well in the picture and the length during the week. Um, the Pope, since his first act in uh, uh, preaching the gospel, has been very clear about preaching that is insightful but also concise. And I think that that's a challenge to negotiate that on weekdays and on Sundays. And again, I think that seminary can image that with students. In addition, the issue of communion being considered in the actual celebration and not in the tabernacle for important theological reasons. This has been very clear since as far back as, as Benedict the 14th that you should distribute communion from the mass where attending. He said, because if you do that, if you, if you go to the tabernacle, people will separate the sacrifice of the mass from the presence of the tabernacle. And he said, it's all war. Now, we tried to do that in many ways. We always did it in the seminary uh, and in daily mass in the parish, but it's certainly an ideal and something that a seminary can control, I think, and give that as a very, very good example of the flow of the liturgy is presentation of the gifts, Eucharistic prayer, Lamb of God, distribution, and dismissal. And there's no going to the tavern. That's the only way. And guided participation, uh, uh, preparation. My thought is, is that the seminary faculty could help the students prepare for liturgy by way of sources of, of text, text and rites, explaining it, explaining that, and, and also uh, walking through the readings of the day and, and how that's going to be a course of daily lecture divina, and that becomes part of the, of the priest's prayer. Uh, there was a study done about 20 years ago in the U.S. of American priests, and they asked, what was the highest source of inspiration for your prayer life? And 90% said the day's readings, because they would read them, prepare them, think about them, give a short homily, and that guided them for the day and the week and the year. So um, the quality of the preaching is also the guided by preparation and, and, and uh, depth. And again, critiques. Um, I want to be careful here. Um, at the Northern American College, we never critiqued anyone right after a mass. No, never, never, never. Because we thought that would make the, the tabernacle would make the liturgy too much of a, a, a laboratory. But eventually, if there was a terrible homily or something within this, um, I would address that or the students surprisingly would address it in, in confidence and uh, in their privacy. So I think the academic churches that you did this wrong. You know, it's personal shaping attitudes and, and doing the right thing and over time getting it right in terms of getting the right right. But in one sense, the real point of liturgy is getting life right. And that's the real challenge. So why liturgy um, of all things uh, from this Pope? Well, I'm going to quote him, who quotes again, Leo the Great. And why liturgy from the very beginning Church has grasped, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, that which is made was made visible in Jesus, that which could be seen with the eyes and touched with the hands, his words and gestures, the concreteness of the incarnate word, everything of him has passed into the celebration of the sacraments. Everything of Christ passed over into the sacraments. That's why it's so important. And that's why formation is important. That's why ongoing formation is important. Texts and rites, lex orandi lex credendi, lexio divina. It's all there. And people like Father Bekesh uh, guided me in my early years into appreciating that. And not a day goes by, and I don't recall my with great fondness, my Benedictine training in religious sacraments. Thank you very much.